so I, I found out that this is a required class for all of you, is that right? I'm so sorry. Uh, this job for me was required as well. Um, as Mark said, I started 11 companies and sold eight, and I sold my last company in 2010 and thought I was done. And um, in November of 2012, my wife uh, called me while I was traveling and said, I found a job for you and I applied online. And all you need to do is write a cover letter and upload your transcription, you'll probably get an interview. And uh, I learned a lot from that phone call. I, I didn't realize that being home um, wasn't virtuous for, for her and that retiring at a young age uh, wasn't also virtuous. And she said, until you have a five in front of your age, you shouldn't be retired. And, uh, and so I, the, the job she uh, had applied for me was uh, here at UVU and it was uh, director of the Small Business Development Center. I'd never heard of the SBDC. Uh, you haven't either and you don't care and I didn't care. Um, but I read the description of the job and it included teaching classes at the Woodbury School of Business and I thought, well, you know, it'd be kind of nice to teach at, at a business school. And then I found out six months into the job that I was an employee of the SBA. And for those that know what the SBA stands for, Small Business Administration Federal Program, and I'm a big believer in what Ronald Reagan said years and years ago, which is the most dangerous words in the English language are, uh, we're the government, we're here to help. And it was like my lightsaber turned the wrong color. You know, it's like, ah, I'm Darth Vader. Um, but it turns out that I was able to hire my entire staff, which are populated by people like me that have run businesses and continue to do so. So uh, the resume needs to be updated a little bit. I've started my 12th business uh, as of January 1st this year. So, um, and the reason that matters to me uh, is that, you know, I can't stand as a relevant resource uh, to you uh, if you're interested in understanding what Google's doing with their latest algorithm and how it impacts, you know, the searchability of your, of your website, if I come to you and say, well, I retired in 2010, why don't we apply that strategy? You just roll your eyes and think, what a stupid old man. Um, and I may be old and I may be stupid, but I'm not that stupid. Um, so we do have really relevant solutions to the things that you want to do for the, if you ever do want to start a business or if you're running a business currently, we focus on the things that matter most. We want to help you grow your revenue, which is selling more of what you make or the service that you offer, and gain access to the capital that you need to grow your business. Because of the things that I did all the time with all of my businesses was like focus intensely on how do I get more revenue through the door profitably? How do I gain access to both the, the, the physical cash as well as the human resources to grow my business and, and keep up with the demand of sales and marketing? And then we deal with the third, kind of the tertiary, way distant thing is everything else that stands in the path of those two things. And, um, and so what I found is as I, as I did these businesses, and they were as disparate as mining in Kazakhstan, literally, I mean, it was Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, um, to wholesale of, of sweets uh, to a regional distribution center, to audio, to um, starting the Shredit franchise for Oregon and Northwest Washington. <clears throat> and totally disparate industries, nothing is similar at all. Uh, I, I started a, an a overnight delivery company that uh, resold DHL services and I thought at least I could maybe tangentially piece that together with the audio because we had overnight delivery. No. But what I found is that for all of these companies, the, I was solving the same problems just in different industries over and over and over again. And uh, because I'm not that bright, I had to write down what my solutions were. And over a period of about a decade and a half, I began to realize that there were principles that I was learning that needed to be applied to each of my businesses. And that's where business essentials training came from. And it was this curriculum that I began to teach my employees and we refined together because it was really, as I started the companies, I would sell one and, and make some modicum of money that may sound like a lot to you, but when you actually have the cash in hand and think, can I live on this for the rest of my life? You double down, put it back on the, on the table and you spin the wheel again and go again. And we double down a lot. And, uh, but each time, um, you know, you're taking the risk and there's something, there's a flaw in my character because I thrive on risk. My passions are kind of high risk activities. In fact, I, I brought some of, this is what I do with my, you know, of course my family. Um, uh, I, I spend a lot of time with, they're much older than that. It makes me look younger, so I keep that, that slide here. But also, I, I compose music at night only for me because it's therapy, and you, would, you wouldn't like it if you heard it, but it makes me feel good. Uh, and then I also, I fly airplanes. Uh, I've been doing that since uh, I was 18 years old. And then uh, it, in my early midlife crisis, in my mid-30s, I started uh, amateur racing on motorcycles. And, 
Um, it turns out that those are high risk activities and they kind of fit, you know, I, I thrive on that moment. And the other thing is, of course, starting businesses, which is for, if you look at the statistics, a very high risk activity. Um, but I thrive on that moment where you don't know what the outcome will be, where you could die <laughs> and as a result of that. You're really hyper attentive, hyper focused on an outcome. And uh, in business, um, the death isn't physical, it's financial. And, and it's every bit as acute. And I have spent more than my fair share of, of days or more, more likely late evenings before payroll is due the next day, wondering where the extra $5,000 is gonna come that I know is gonna be drawn out of my account by paychecks to pay the people that you know, work hard for me. And, uh, and where's it, you know, solving that problem, sitting, you know, laying in the fetal position, crying myself to sleep. If you love that kind of thing, then business ownership and entrepreneurship is for you. If you don't, you ought to consider becoming a really good employee. Uh, and then don't listen to the phone calls of your boss when he's calling the bank saying, can you please extend my credit line this much further and, uh, and solve the problem. But there, the, the, the running a business, just like staying healthy, it really runs on principles. And one of the things that I went to college for was to gain a, a formal education on how to run businesses. I started my first business that isn't in this list of 11 when I was 17, when I learned mowing lawns that I could actually pay my, my friends that I played ball with, I could pay them double minimum wage. They were thrilled because they could go out and get a tan while they mow the lawns. And I could sell the lawn for 20 bucks a whack and pay them you know, less. And, and I got a bunch of guys mowing lawns and I was making 80 bucks an hour which, and I won't tell you the decade, but it was a long decade ago, but right now, if you made 80 bucks an hour, that's still good money. And I was making 80 bucks an hour in high school. And I learned the value of leveraging my time through other people. And that was powerful. And then to understand the mechanics of how to market and how to deliver and how to get people where they need to go, the logistics of delivery, the cost of goods, uh, repairing you know, uh, sprinkling systems that they would run over with uh, you know, it just complete disregard for the cost to me of repairing the system, that kind of stuff. So even at a young age, I began to understand the complexity of what business required. And that helped me see those patterns as I got older and got more sophisticated businesses under my belt uh, with much more complex problems to solve. But the activities that I was solving really fell into these seven categories. I was marketing, and marketing and sales are different. I'll explain the difference. Um, I was doing financial analysis. I was doing what we call the DNA, which under the DNA of the organization really talks about brand and HR, and we'll talk about why I combine those two. And then operations, funding, and legal issues. And I haven't had an activity in the last 30 years of my businesses that hasn't fallen under one of these activities. Now, three of these things you do all the time. You are juggling these three balls every single day. Sales marking and a financial analysis. And we're gonna add operations to it because if you can't deliver on the promise of sales and marketing, you'll fail. And most companies fail as a result of growing more rapidly than they're capable of handling by supply and demand, or supplying their product to the demand that they've created. But the other four items, which include operations, are things that you're dealing with episodically. You know, you'll set up a vendor relationship or you'll set up a line that can handle a certain capacity and that capacity is fine for now and it's good for maybe six months to a year or even two years and then you grow into that capacity. Being in a startup is like raising a teenager and trying to buy clothes for them. Uh, I've got a 13 year old boy and I don't buy size 12 for him or size 14. It's like, can I get you to size 16? You know, and, and you know, really long shoes because uh, he, he, in fact, he told me yesterday, I need new shoes, Dad. How old are these shoes? Well, I started the school year with them. I'm like, okay, shoes are good for four months, you know? But you episodically kind of have to resize everything he wears. And that's the same thing in these areas here. Under HR and brand, you really, if you do your work well about who your brand is, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, then you don't revisit that every year. You know, this is kind of fundamental uh, work that you do that, that really lives the life of your organization. HR is really understanding that who you get into your organization to help you execute on your strategies is as important as what it is you do. In fact, I would postulate that the most important decision you're going to make isn't the business you're going to do, but the people that you're going to do your business with. And I'll, there are all kinds of great statistics around and, and good research around the, the validity of that statement. 
But when I got my formal education, I was looking for this kind of information. And in my undergraduate in organizational communication and a minor in management from a great school, it was ranked fifth in the nation for that particular mm -hmm. degree, um, they didn't teach me this. And then when I went on uh, and started companies in about oh, eight years in, I, was, I doubled down and it really mattered because I had literally drained my children's college fund, which had been fully funded the year before by the sale of the previous business. And my wife was not thrilled at the thought that we were gambling that. Um, I decided maybe I better get a master's degree and maybe they know more than they did at the undergraduate. And not to diss formal education, it's wonderful. But it's not gonna teach you how to run a business. It'll teach you siloed, um, skill sets and frankly the skill sets that matter most to you in business are the ones that you typically statistically shy away from and it's accounting and statistics and financial forecasting and this the hard sciences so as you, if you're business majors and and you really want to leave with functional tools it's not your negotiation skills or your soft skills it'd be your hard skills and so if, if those are not native to you to what you do as a gift um, they can become native by repetition. Just like if you wanted to become great at anything, you know the 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, right? Apply that to, to your math-based your math uh, skill sets that you can be learning here in the university. But what this was for us is a, is a playbook. How do we play this game? What a, what's the decision tree when we have uh, a challenge facing us? Um, when, our, when we see a decline in the sales of a particular uh, line of product, how do we evaluate what to do next? And that's what this is. So these are the things that we deal with episodically. You set up operations. If you're going to funding regularly, you're not in business, right? So, but, but funding is, is I, I did not know that my job as a CEO included begging with my, you know, my hat in hand for money all the time, even when we're successful. And so you need to understand how to do that effectively and what are the tools that you bring to the table when you sit with an investor or a bank or any other source of income or potential funding and convince them that you're a risk worth taking, right? And so uh, the last are legal issues and those are really broken into um, kind of pre-launch and then post-launch and the considerations that you have. And this is the curriculum that we brought to the BRC and began teaching when I was the director of the Small Business Development Center. Now, to tell you about its efficacy, we are, the, we are a third, the area that we serve here in the Utah Valley and Wasatch Valley has a third as many businesses as they have in Salt Lake. And we were the number one SBDC in the state of Utah and hit all of our numbers for revenue growth, capital acquired, jobs created, uh, business starts, um, whatever the other stupid metrics are, those are the only four that matter, um, by May of last year. And instead of them coming to learn what we were doing differently, we got audited because they thought we were committing fraud. It turns out we passed the audit. And so this, this year, to give them the proper salute that they deserved, we got, hit double our revenue for 2015 by February, and they didn't audit us. But it was applying these to the businesses that we serve. Now, the reason I'm here is that we have the elven cloak of invisibility on. Nobody knows about us. And if you are a business in the valley, to not avail yourself to the great counselors that we have that are solving the problems that matter to you, whether you're in the same industry or not, I promise you. Is there, how many here own a business or are running a business? Is there anybody here that is not interested in growing their revenue profitably? Of the things you're dealing with, is growing your revenue the number one thing you're most concerned about? It is for me and then having access to capital, really smart capital, inexpensive capital, to be able to buy the equipment or hire the people or it, buy the inventory necessary to keep up with your growth. That's what we focus on. In fact, <clears throat> back to the Ronald Reagan thing, when I went to my first director's meeting at the Small Business Development Center, the state director of the Small Business Development Center had never worked in private industry. And he was ranting in the first meeting, just pounding the table literally. We need to be the most relevant resource. It was louder, it was a big table. Uh, for businesses in Utah, how do we become the most relevant resource? And I, the whole room was silent. I was the newest guy, I didn't want to speak up. Nobody spoke up and so I, he said, what do you think we should do? I said, we should help companies grow their revenue, gain access to capital and solve the problems that stand in the path of those two things. And his comment was, or question was, how do you know that that's important to business? I was just slack-jawed. I didn't even know how to respond to that ignorance. I mean, like, what? I got to survey that? So thank you for the data points. You know, now we'll add that to our library. 
Um, but I, I promise you, those are the most important things. And understanding how to solve those problems is important. So let's talk about really what each of these represent and why we focus on them. And we're going to focus really heavily on the first three and then scamper through the last ones because my definition of a really good presentation is one that ends early. And so I'll try to do that. And we're supposed to get out at what, 20, 10 till? 10. Okay, we'll, we'll scramble. So the first part is making sure that you are solving a problem uniquely. First, if you aren't solving a problem, don't go into business, right? But make sure that you're solving a problem and that you're doing it uniquely. That's where the plant the flag is thing. You know, when I started the audio company, for example, um, I put all of the advertisements of my competition on the wall, and it was Wilson and Paradigm and Klipsch and you know, names that maybe you're familiar with that you aren't. But what's the one name that everybody thinks is great audio? It's not the ones I just mentioned. Bose, Bose. Bose. Ex ex absolutely. It's the aspirational brand. But in the industry, for those of us that know good audio, no highs, no lows, it's got to be Bose. That's how we diss the main competition, you know. But they're great at marketing. And so where would I go? Because if you looked at Bose, which is, you know, great sound through engineering, and then everybody else's, you could have literally taken their logos and put them on each other's ad because they all said the same thing. We're better than Bose. That's what they said over and over and over again. That was where they planted their flag. And we decided that you can't plant your flag there it's already owned by either our major competition or by Bose. And so we had to come up with a completely different place to plant your flag. And then when you plant it there, if it turns out to be profitable, it's like yelling to everybody, there's gold right here, come on in. And everybody rushes to you, right? So you've gotta be, that's why we put this thing about become a prairie dog. You've gotta become productively paranoid. You know, you dig a little and do your work and then say, who's coming to eat me? Usually it's competition. So those are the things that are part of this marketing strategy, but you've got to answer these things. What problem am I solving? And when I say problem, it's not just, you know, the problem here as, oh, I provide speakers and you want them. It's at an emotive level, at an emotional level. What am I providing you that, that satisfies you in a way that you go, you know, you have this thing, you know, wow, I click with that brand. I click with their solution. How is my solution unique? And that typically is feature set as well as delivery potentially. <laughs> And then last is, what's the value proposition? So let me translate that as an example of what I mean by this. So let's say, for example, who are you? Tyson. Tyson, Tyson do you happen to snowboard or do anything dangerous? Not really. Let's pretend like you did, OK? <laughs> and so Tyson, this athletic figure, uh, snowboards a lot, and he, and he breaks his arm. And I go to Tyson, and I say, because one of the things you're going to learn in, next is that, is that um, well, we'll go back here. <coughs> Um, with, and, and I didn't put it in here because we had to cut it out, that's why, because we don't have any time. You identify the problem, amplify the problem, resolve the problem. Those, that's the marketing messaging. So following that methodology, I, I go to Tyson and say, Tyson, your arm hurts. He says, yeah, my arm really hurts, it's broken. I say, would it hurt if I, and I go to him and he reflexively, you know, he draws back, when? Don't screw with my broken arm. Well, what if I lift it up, when? Don't screw with my broken arm. And so I understand the problem. He broke it while he was you know, in the half pipe doing tricks that he wasn't really physically fit to do or, or didn't understand how to do and, and, and thrashed himself. And, uh, and then I hold up this thing that looks a lot like a sling. And we have this moment, he and I, where he looks at that sling and goes, hmm, I intuitively know how that could solve my problem, right? So then the next issue is what we call the pain price threshold. He's in pain, I got a solution, I got a price. So now we negotiate, and I say, it's $2,000. And he thinks in his head, when is stupid? But now that I've seen his concept, I could take his tie or go buy a tie you know, really cheaply and tie my arm up, and that would work. Or I could say, it's 1999, and he goes, ah, 19, well, great, give me three. And, uh, and if it was a different gender audience, they'd say, and what other colors do you have? <laughs> right? It's true. So. Um, so we would have this transaction. And if, if, but if it's really close to the pain price threshold, he might have what we call buyer's remorse, where it's, well, I spent a lot of money on that, but boy, it's really cool. So back to this. What problem am I solving? Pain. pain. He's, he broke his arm, right? And so the sling might help it mend right, properly, right? And my solution, is it unique? Really? I did the research, 218 companies in the United States sell slings. So is it unique? No. 
But the value proposition is one where the transactionally he relates to it, goes, yes, this makes sense. <clears throat> but what if, instead of this sling being a sling, I said, so how did you break your arm? And he says, gal, you're the 20th person to ask me today how I broke my arm. And I've just written it up because I'm tired of, now I've broken legs and arms. I've had my shoulder reconstructed. I've had my legs cut off and reattached, literally. Uh, and, and, and so been on crutches and had to explain all the, and there's a lot to the story and I'm not gonna go into it, but I could hand it to you and you could read it. But what if instead, since we all have hero cameras or we have uh, our phones and our buddies are watching us for the next fail video, right? Uh, they're watching us do this thing they know we can't do and they actually encouraged us to do it because they wanted the fail video and he was the guinea pig. What if instead of that, he says, boy, if you could solve that problem and have to explain it, great, why don't we put a picture, a high, a high, you know, high res picture on your sling of you hitting the ground and that tooth that you lost, it's like right here flying out of your face. Wouldn't that be cool? Great. So we'll do that. In fact, what I can do is send you a sling a week with a different photo on it. And we'll, out, we'll also open a website for you where you can upload all of your pictures and videos so they can see what a BA you are in that half pipe. And now, that, is this a sling that's medically treating him? Yeah. But what else is it? Unique. How? What's it, what's it pandering to? His ego, right, right. And, and I know you don't have one, humble man, but some of us in the, in the crowd do. And the thought that maybe, you know, putting a billboard of our BA activities right here or on our leg or on our back or around our neck um, might be kind of interesting and a completely different approach to an item that was kind of ubiquitous before. So when we talk about a unique solution, that's the kind of solution set you're looking for. Not, oh, it holds his arm up, and oh, it's got, you know, uh, we put a little fleece on there to make it soft and warm. That doesn't matter to you. You're a BA. You want people to know you live a life so much on the edge, you break your body right at the threshold of, of where you live. And that's the kind of, and now, is 19.99 a reasonable price? Could I charge more? I don't think it'll be anywhere close to two grand, right? But if I offered him a monthly subscription at $39.99, which included the website and his ability to upload, and he could hit, say, click, and he gets a new one, that's a, and we deliver it for free for 20 bucks each time. And then afterwards, he's not gonna throw them away, he's gonna put them on his wall. That's what you're looking for. That emotive response with a truly unique solution to something that could be as ubiquitous as a sling. And then the, the value proposition becomes really something that's negotiated and is more than just, what's the cost of material plus 20%, right? Or cost of goods plus whatever margin you're putting in there. Another person came into my office that has a math solution, um, a, a mathematics training program where she can teach one through 14, and one everybody knows, right? But one through 14 within, uh, within 90 minutes with a 90 day, 98% retention. So, and she can't sell it for $19.99. So we sat down and we went through this process of trying to understand, well, what's the problem she's solving? Well, she can train people how to teach you know, their kids math, at least the, the multiplication tables, which is the foundation of, if you don't know your multiplication tables, you're gonna struggle through algebra. If you don't get algebra, you'll never get to the real math that matters, which is calculus. And if you haven't learned calculus, you are denying yourself of the joy of life because calculus is the reason math was created. And you, go th you suffer through algebra just so you can get to calculus. But if you don't know your math tables, you'll never bother with algebra. And it was, not, it was unique. It had great statistics, but she couldn't, she couldn't find a price point that moved them. And so the work we did was long and arduous because she couldn't get past the 1999 thing. So I asked her, I said, so what is the lifetime earning capacity of somebody that is really good at math? What are the careers that they can go into where if they're not good at math, they exempt themselves from those educational opportunities? So science, out the door. Medicine, out the door. Engineering, out the door. Computer science, out the door. And if you look at the lifetime earning capacity of the careers associated with those majors, as opposed to philosophy, religion, psychology, art, 
If you're art mages, great. You're just not gonna make your money back, that's all. Huge difference. Turns out to be four and a half million dollars lifetime earnings. Four and a half million dollars. So if you can turn a kid on to an excitement around understanding their multiplication tables, and we're talking about the value proposition being lifetime earnings, does that make the 1999 a little more palatable? Sure, 1999 investment that might increase your earning capacity by millions of dollars. So those are the things that we work with our clients to solve, and these are the problems I had to solve with every business I've ever owned. And if you, are, you get to the place where you don't have an emotive element, get out of the business because it will become a commodity and you are not ever gonna be big enough to be a commodity player in any space that you might occupy. On the sales side, um, you need to understand no money, no mission. I don't care how noble your cause is. You've got to make money in every transaction. You've got to understand how it is that you do that. And you, in, in that previous part up here, as far as the value proposition, you need to make sure you're charging enough so that you make good bank. You don't want to, even not for profits. I have no idea where the concept that companies that are not for profit aren't supposed to be profitable. Not for profit means you don't pay taxes on your profit. It doesn't mean you're not supposed to be profitable. This university, and I'll say it out loud because I know the numbers, is hugely profitable. It's just a not-for-profit institution. They make more money than they pay out. And their budget continues to grow. Now, in the public sector, that's how they define success. And I'm still getting used to that because it's a completely different way for making money. Um, I got berated because I didn't spend all my, my budget last year. I was like, look, you know, little dog with a bone in my, look, I brought back, a, you know, a bunch of money. And they were like, what? You brought us money at this late hour? You've got to go spend it. On what? Well, if you don't spend it, you're going to lose it next year. Okay. What? Well, then we've got to spend it because it's part of our, you know, it's just nuts. Um, anyway, a little ranting here. Back to no, no margin, no mission. You've got to understand that you, you really need to understand how you make your money and that you add margin. Keystone, is keystone pricing is, a, is a, an industry standard in most every industry except jewelry and grocery, um, where if I make something for a buck, I sell it to you for two. Uh, in the retail chain, if I make something for a buck, I sell it to distribution for two. They sell it to retail for four, and retail sells it to you for eight. That's why internet sales are so popular, because you cut out so many people in the distribution chain and get more product for your dollar buying direct from manufacturing. And the sales funnel, it's really about the numbers game. I mean, if we were in insurance sales, a sales funnel like this would look something like, how many cold calls do you make? How many appointments do you set? How many, presenta uh, how many uh, presentations do you make? How many uh, applications do you take? How many closes are there and how much commission do you collect? And each of those steps is a smaller and smaller number. Uh, for me, in one of my companies, it's how many qualified eyeballs do I get to my site? What's the, uh, what's the conversion rate of the site? What's the size of the sale? What's my, what are my discounts and returns? And each of the, at each of those steps, I have levers that I can manipulate to try to enhance the quality of the people coming to my site. Quali quality meaning they're interested in what I sell, right? And how do I measure that? Well, by their behavior. If they show up on my site and they don't do anything but bounce, they weren't interested and they didn't come from a qualified location. They stumbled and they left. Qualified people stay for an, a minute or more and go to more than two, two pages on my site. And so the places that send more people that do that to my site, I wanna spend more marketing dollars on, follow? So as you manage this sales funnel down into, uh, right here into kind of how it's divided, you're really using this to solve this problem. You get, you've got to solve this for every single company you're going to have. Awareness, confidence, uh, try, buy, repeat, and refer. Awareness is you can't, you, I can't buy this as a clicker unless I even know it exists, right? So historically, awareness came from things like print ads and television and radio. Uh, confidence came from those as well, you know, as seen on TV, you know, and, and with fair trade practices, nobody can lie, right? And um, so nobody lies on TV. So if you saw it on TV, you know you can buy it with confidence. Uh, now, social media has replaced much of the traditional media for, um, for awareness and confidence. I, I trust my friends more than I trust even the editors of magazines because I know the game they play. They review product that they get paid to review. Um, then how do you get them to, to this part? This is the tough one. How do you get them to even try it? Catalogs, 
uh, Kellogg's uh, cereal sends out over a million samples every year. Do you have any clue what percentage of those little boxes that get you get in your mailbox get thrown away? Yes, like 98% of them get thrown away. A free sample of you're not even willing to take the time to open the box and pour your milk on it for fear that you've wasted your milk for something that you might like, like the taste of. So how do you get somebody to try something that they've never seen, heard, tasted, been referred, you know? So that's a really important issue. There's this tipping point, and there's all kinds of good science around how to get that to happen. One of my companies is an audio company. We sell speakers online to consumers. The average purchase is $1,100, and they've never heard our speaker. It's direct to consumer, you know, that math, if I buy it for a buck, I sell it to distribution for two, distribution to retail for four, retail to you for eight. I sell it to you for two bucks. And you get way more wire and speaker and metal and all that stuff for the dollars you spend. But how do I get you convinced to do that? Well, there are all kinds of cool strategies, but you need to understand what they are. And they are industry specific and audience specific. And then once they try it, how do you get them to actually part with the cash? And then once they part with the cash, have they had such a wonderful experience that they're going to bother to come back to you as a loyal customer? Or if your purchase, like mine, is a 10-year cycle, repurchase is a 10-year cycle, how do you get them to you know, refer you to their circle of influence? And there are all kinds of strategies for solving that problem as well. I already talked about identifying the problem, amplifying the problem, and resolving the problem. We did that with this broken arm. But it's, it, how many here play an instrument? OK. So anybody here know what a tuning fork is? I guess we use tuning devices now. We don't use forks. But anciently, we used forks. And you hit a fork, and it would do like the, the note of C. Well, if you went into a room full of tuning forks and hit the C note, all of the tuning forks that were C notes would begin to vibrate on, that, on their frequency. And all the rest would remain silent, except the harmonics. And that's what marketing is like. You have to have the courage to understand that not all of the population of the world is your audience, even though they may break their arms occasionally. It's only those that have a specific emotional need to share with people what a BA they are, right? And if you understand that is, where are we going to find people like him that want to put this on their, you know, this badge of honor on their arm or on their leg? Where, where do we find people like him? Where? At ski resorts. At ski resorts, X Games. Uh, skate, skate parks, right? Doing extreme things. Uh, down in Slick Rock, where, so that's where we add, that's where we would advertise. And so if, if you can frame the, your offering that cleanly, you begin to understand how you become geniuses at marketing, which is really the messaging of your, of your product offering. And the sales is the, is the connection of that with the individual. The last of the three most important issues that you're going to be dealing with is financial analysis. And to that end, you need to understand what a performa spreadsheet is. A performa is a way of looking at your forecasted activities of marketing and how they translate into cash and the cost of those activities and whether or not you're going to make any money each and every month. And of the things that have helped me make more money than any of the others is understanding the, the mechanics of forecasting accurately. And that's why I go back to the hard sciences. It's really important for you to pay attention in, in your, in your math-related classes. Statistical analysis, that's how I determine whether or not the product I'm getting from my manufacturing partner is even compliant with the, the standards that we've established. And if I have a thousand products, how many of those do I need to sample? Statistically, you can figure that out if you want a 98% confidence interval. Understanding what, you know, th this is kind of a, 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 a very truncated performa, but it has three columns. Here's my forecast, here's what I actually did, and here's the variance. So what do you know about colors? Which one did I do well in? The green. And which one am I really concerned about? Right. And so on expenses, if you've overspent, you would have it. And if you've, and if you've underspent, it would look green. Well, you need to understand why. And here's an example. I had one of our clients that had an intellectual property. Uh, they had a trademark. And the, or excuse me, a patent. And they had to renew their patent with a license. And they budgeted, we had budgeted with them this this spend of, on legal. And the legal was a $5,000 spend. And at the end of the month, we looked at it and said, you, you only spent 2,500 bucks. Uh, what did you do? Negotiate better rates with your attorney? Why, why were you off here? That's like not paying your whole rent or something. You know, this wasn't a variable cost that should have been that different. 
And he looked at it, and although it was green, which is usually good, he realized he hadn't paid his patent renewal fee. And we caught it within three days of his patent not being able to be renewed. So understanding how these work and setting them up properly, this gets you into the grist of your business. And when you understand this, you then understand the activities necessary to drive this. And back to that sales funnel, you look at each of the things that drive traffic down to an actual transaction, which we call a contribution margin, and that's how you make money. Now the other items associated with it are things like DNA, and that's understanding your purpose. Why are you here doing this thing? And it isn't because people break their arms. There should be some more um, fundamental reason that, that nourishes a part of you that's your better nature. And you need to dig down to that. And then the values, I, I, I uh, was a Boy Scout, and there are trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, you know, the 12 things you're supposed to be. I'm like four of them. I aspire to the other eight. I'm not gonna tell you what four I am and what eight I'm not. But if I'm gonna start a company with values that have some sense of who I am, I gotta choose values that are like the four, not the eight. Because a true brand isn't a lab coat you put on and take off. It's an expression of you. And when you go to find people to go with you, remember the most important decision you're gonna make is who you associate with, not what you do. 92% of all businesses in five, that start today in five years will be fundamentally in a different business than they started. And the ability to navigate to success, to stay alive for five years as you're constantly pivoting your offering is really associated with the creativity and, and, and intelligence of the people you're associated with. So you wanna have people that are not only just smart, but that you have some common DNA with. Now, I also, the other element to that is as diverse as you can possibly stomach. So in, in the Utah Valley, diversity is like blonde brunette. I'm talking gender diversity, racial diversity, religious diversity, as much diversity as you can possibly get because then the solution set is as broad, is much broader. They don't look at, you don't want people looking at the world the way you look at it because then you'll get a solution set that you came up with and that's useless. But understanding that you have common values and those values aren't you know, that you belong to the same religion but that you have values in how you live life and see the world that are common, and you'll find that they're pretty broad if you traveled broadly. Um, then you end up with this really compelling synergy of people looking for solutions that are really cool and creative, and you don't have to be like Moses coming down from the mountain with the tablet saying, this is what you're supposed to do. That's really a destructive way of running a company. When you have the right people on the bus, make sure they're in the right seat. That means they're in their gift, not their competence, their gift. What they're really, what they, you know, like me, I get sweaty palmed and I talk fast, my throat gets tight when I talk about running businesses. I love that. And that you align self-interest. And it isn't just about payment, it's about a whole variety of ways of aligning self-interest. On operations, it's making sure you can deliver on the promise. There's the pre-go to market and what you do and the post-go to market, it's up there, I don't need to read it. Um, then you have, you test the idea, uh, you, you perfect the idea, you streamline the process, that's when you, and then afterwards it's all about driving cost out of the process such that you don't hamper the promise of the brand. When it comes to funding, as I said before, you're going to spend a lot of time talking to people about why they should consider investing in your company and understanding what you're going to use that money for. There's really only a few reasons to go to the capital markets. It's to survive to profitability or to grow your business capacity to meet the demand of sales and for no other reason. Survive to profitability or to grow the capacity of your company. So you are at three years and you're gonna buy that you know, five year capacity so you can grow rapidly into it, maybe get there in four years. So the last are legal issues and there are myriad legal issues and we help you through all of them. We don't, we're not attorneys, we don't pretend to be, um, but we've solved a lot of the, I've solved, you know, I, I paid, I, I calculated, actually went through my ledgers and said, how much have I spent on intellectual property for filing trademark, litigation, and patents? Turns out I've spent just under three quarters of a million dollars and sat in all those meetings. And most expensive tuition in the world. But I know a little bit about the topic as a result of hiring really smart people to teach me about it. And we know a little bit about the topic and can at least guide you through the process of organizing your business and filing trademarks, filing patents. Um, but again, those are the things that you do periodically, episodically. You're never gonna be doing those every day. 
And those are the seven categories of activities you're gonna find yourself involved in uh, if you decide to, to start or run a business. And frankly, if you're an employee, you've got knowing this is so incredibly important to you because you'll be a more effective employee as a contribution to the success of your organization. So I think we're at four minutes, and I know you don't have any questions, so we can end. <laughs> or is there a question and answer thing? Yeah. Oh, there is? There oh. Any questions? Yes? We can help you with trademark. Patent requires a narrative to explain what prior art you may have been using and why it's unique. Um, for you to file a patent, you have to have what's, what the trademark office calls, uh, trademark and patent office calls a moment of genius. And you have to demonstrate that it is truly unique and not a natural extension of an existing product. But we can put you in touch with people that do that at a fairly reasonable rate. Okay, do you, does anybody know where the BRC is? How many here know where Wendy's is? Wendy's Texaco on University Parkway. Okay, we're behind it. How many people know where that big black box is where they show the video of everybody's failing and they say, don't fail, use our credit card services? Okay, turn, it's, we're kitty corner behind that building. We're right behind, uh, we're not right behind IHOP, we're right behind uh, the, the, um, the Texaco Wendy's. Any other questions that I think you should leave early? <laughs>